Chapter Nine of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Counter Confessions. Before Keefe went away, young Allen had a serious talk with him. I want to ask your advice, Allen said. Shall I confess to that crime? Man alive, what are you talking about? Keefe cried, astounded at the suggestion. Talking sense, Jeffrey stoutly asserted. I don't believe any one of those three did it. They're saying they did to shield one another. And so, and so you want to get into the game. Keefe smiled at him. You're very young, my boy, to think such crude methods would get over, even with such muffs as those two booby sleuths. No, Alan, don't add another perjury that can be of no possible use. You didn't do the killing, did you? Of course not, but neither did the Wheelers. No one of them? Certainly not. Who did then? I don't know, but you yourself insisted on some marauder. Only to get suspicion away from the family but there's no use of finding any evidence of an outside job. You see, I've made some inquiries myself, and the servants' tales make it pretty sure that no intruder could have been here. So the Wheelers are the only suspects left. And am I not as good for a suspect as they are? If I make due confession? No, Alan, you're not. You're in love with Miss Maida. I'm engaged to her. All right, don't you see, then, the absurdity of expecting anyone to believe that you, a decent law-abiding young citizen, would commit a murder which would positively render impossible a marriage with the girl you love? I didn't think of that. Of course you didn't. But that would make it unlikely that those detectives would believe your tale for a moment. No, it's ridiculous for any more people to confess to this murder. Three avowed criminals are quite enough for the crime. But none of them really did it. How you harp on that string. Now look here, Alan. I'm as loath to believe it as you are, but we must face facts. Those three people had motive and opportunity. Moreover, they're a most united family, and if any one thought either of the other two guilty, that one is quite capable of falsely avowing the crime. Yes, I see that, Alan spoke impatiently. What I want to know is what we're going to do about it. There I can't advise you. I have to get away now, but as I said, I'll return. I've more than a little taste for investigation myself. And when I come back, I've no doubt I can help. But, Keefe, I don't want you to help, to investigate, if it's going to prove anything on any of the Wheelers. But you believe them innocent. Yes, but crime has been fastened on the innocent. Look here, Alan, do you believe them innocent, but you fear your belief is a mistaken one? God help me. I do fear that, Keefe. Oh, what can we do? It's a bad lookout. All I can say now is to preserve a non-committal demeanor and keep things stationary as much as you can. Maybe when I come back we can, well, at least muddle things so, complicate the evidence so that it won't indicate. Be careful now. You know what compounding a felony means, don't you? Oh, Alan, you're so young and impulsive, and the Wheelers are so emotional and indiscreet. I wonder what will happen before I get back. Someone ought to be in charge here. Yes, some good lawyer or some level-headed person who would hold back those fool detectives and look out for the interests of the Wheelers. I wish you could stay. I wish so, too, but I'll do all I can to return quickly. And Mr. Wheeler ought to be able to look after his own affairs. I know he ought to but he isn't. Also, I ought to, but I'm not. Yes, you are, Geoffrey, cried Maida, who had happened along in time to hear the young man's depreciation of himself. 
hello maida he turned to her what did you mean by making up that string of falsehoods don't talk about it jeff and the girl's face went white if you do i shall go mad i don't wonder miss wheeler said keefe sympathetically now as i've told allen i'm coming back as soon as i can make it and until i do won't you try to hold off those men don't let them pound you and your parents into admissions better left unmade i'm not asking you any questions i've no right to but i beg of you to keep your own counsel if you are shielding someone say as little as possible if you are guilty yourself say nothing guilty herself you've no right to say such a thing allan cried out of course i have keefe returned when i heard miss wheeler avow the crime but i must go now here's the car good-bye both of you and miss wheeler if i may advise don't confide too much in anybody the last words were spoken in an aside and if allan heard them he gave no sign he bade keefe good-bye with a preoccupied air and as others joined them then he waited till the car started and then took maida's arm and led her away toward the garden miss lane of course went with keefe and as the girls parted maida had suddenly felt a sense of loneliness i liked genevieve a lot she said to allan as they walked away i didn't he returned oh jeff you are so quick to take prejudices against people i don't mean i'm specially fond of genevieve but she was kind to me and now i do seem so alone alone maida when you have your parents and me what do you mean i can't tell you exactly but i do seem to want someone someone with wide experience and educated judgment to whom i can go for advice won't i do dear you're kind enough and loving enough but jeff you don't know things i mean you haven't had experience in in criminal cases come on maida let's have it out what about this criminal case of ours for it's mine as much as it's yours oh no it isn't jeff you've nothing to do with it i must bear my burden alone and i must ask you to release me from our engagement which i will never do how absurd now maida mine if you won't speak out i must i know perfectly well you never killed mr appleby i know too that you saw either your father or mother kill him and you're trying to shield the criminal very right too except that you mustn't keep the truth from me how can i help you dear unless i know what you're doing or trying to do so tell me the truth now i can't tell you more than i have jeff maida spoke with a long-drawn sigh you must believe me and as a a murderer i never of course shall marry maida you're a transparent little prevaricator don't think i don't realize the awful situation for i do but i can't i won't let you sacrifice yourself for either of your parents i don't ask you which one it was in fact i'd rather you wouldn't tell me but i do ask you to believe that i know it wasn't you now drop that foolishness Jeffrey, and maida spoke very solemnly don't you believe that i could kill a man if he was so cruel so dangerous to my father my dear father that i couldn't stand it another minute don't you believe i'd be capable of killing him we've spoken of that before maida and i think i said i believed you would be capable in a moment of sudden intense anger and excitement well then why do you doubt my word i told the detectives i tell you that the moment came i saw my father under stress of terrible anger in immediate desperate danger from samuel appleby i i shot to kill the girl broke down and geoffrey took the slender quivering form in his arms all right sweetheart he whispered don't say another word i understand i don't blame you how could you think i would 
I just want to help you. How can I best do that? But Maida could not tell him. Her tears, once started, came in torrents. Her whole frame shook with the intensity of her sobs, and unable to control herself at all, she ran from him into the house and up to her own room. "'What did you find out?' Burden asked, coming out from behind a nearby clump of shrubbery. "'You sneak, you cad!' Allen cried, but the detective stopped him. "'Now look here, Mr. Allen,' he said. "'We're here to do our duty, said duty being to discover the perpetrator of a pretty awful crime. You may be so minded as to let the murderer go scot-free, even help him or her to make a getaway. But I can't indulge in any such philanthropic scheme. Mr. Appleby's been foully murdered, and it's up to the law to find out the killer and see justice done. My job is not a pleasant one. But I've got to see it through, and that's all there is about that. Now, this case is what we call open and shut. The murderer is sure and positively one of the three people. Said three people being known to us. So I've just got to use all my powers to discover which of the three I'm really after, and when I find that out, then make my arrest. But I've no desire to nab the wrong one. "'Which one do you think it is?' demanded Alan angrily. "'I've got no right nor reason to think it's either one. "'I've got to find out for sure, not just think it. "'So I ask you what you learned just now from Miss Wheeler, "'and why did she run into the house weeping like a willow tree? "'I found out nothing that would throw any light on your quest. And she wept because her nerves are strained to the breaking point with worry and exhaustion. And I don't wonder. The detective spoke sympathetically. But all the same, I'm obliged to keep on investigating, and I must ask you what she said to you just now. Alan thought over the conversation he had had with Maida. Then he said, I am telling the truth when I say there was no word said between us that would be of any real use to you. Miss Wheeler is my fiancé, and I tried to comfort her, and also to assure her anew of my faithfulness and devotion in her trouble. And what did she say? Without remembering her words exactly, I think I can state that she said nothing more than to reiterate that she had killed Mr. Appleby but I want to state also that I believe she said it, as she said it to you, to shield someone else. Her parents, or one of them? That is the reasonable supposition, but I do not accuse either of the elder wheelers. I still suspect an intruder from outside. Of course you do. Anybody in your position would, but there was none such. It was one of the three wheelers, and I'll proceed to find out which one. Just how do you propose to find out? Well, the one that did it is very likely to give it away. It's mighty difficult to be on your guard every minute, and with one guilty and two shielding, and all three knowing which is which, as I've no doubt they do, why, it's a cinch that one of the three breaks down through sheer over-carefulness pretty soon. That's true enough, Alan agreed ruefully. Is that your only plan? Yes, except to look up the weapon. It's a great help always to find the revolver. Hoping to find the criminal's initials on it? Well, no, they don't mark firearms in real life as they do in storybooks, but to find the weapon gives a lot of evidence as to where it was fired from and what was done with it afterward, and to whom it belongs. Not that the owner is always the murderer. More often the reverse is true. But the weapon we want, and we want pretty badly. By the way, I'm told that young Appleby is out of the running for governor now that his father isn't here to help him through. More, I take it, because of his grief for his father's untimely end. Be that as it may, He'll withdraw his name from the candidates. Who told you? 
I heard Mr. Keefe telling Miss Lane. You hear a lot, Burden. I do, Mr. Allen. It's my business to do so. Now here's another thing, about the garage fire. Well, what about it? It was a mighty mysterious fire, that's all. Nobody knows how it started or where. They must know where. Not exactly. It seemed to start in the vicinity of Mr. Appleby's own car, but there was nothing inflammable around that part of the garage. Well, what does that prove or indicate? Anything prejudicial to the wheelers? Not so far as I can see. Only it's queer, that's all. Perhaps Mr. Appleby kept tobacco and matches in his car. Perhaps so. Anyway, that's where the fire originated, and also about where it stopped. They soon put it out. Glad they did. I can't see that the fire has any bearing whatever on the murder. Neither can I, Mr. Allen. But how and now, he thinks it has. Just how? I can't say. Hallen doesn't know himself, but he says there's a connection. There may be, but unless it's a connection that will free the Wheelers from suspicion, it doesn't interest me. Allen left the detective, who made no effort to detain him, and went to the den for a talk with Mr. Wheeler. But that gentleman, locked in the room, declared through the closed door that he would see nobody. Sorry, Jeff, he said in a kindly tone, but you must excuse me at present. Give me the day to myself. I'll see you late this afternoon. As it was already noon, Allen made no further attempt at an interview and went in search of Mrs. Wheeler. It seemed to him he must talk to some of the family, and he hadn't the heart to disturb Maida, who might be resting. Mrs. Wheeler's maid said that her mistress would see him in a few minutes, and it was only a few minutes later that the lady came downstairs and greeted Allen, who awaited her in the living room. "'What are we going to do?' she exclaimed to him. "'Do help us, Jeff. Did I do right?' "'In lying to save someone you love? Yes, I suppose so. But Sarah Wheeler had very acute hearing. Even as they spoke, she heard a slight movement on the porch outside, and realized at once that a detective was listening to her every word. Allen couldn't be sure whether this changed her mental attitude or whether she continued as she had meant to when she began. But she said, Oh, I don't mean that. I mean, did I do right to confess my crime at once? You know they will discover it sooner or later, and I thought it would save time and trouble for me to own up immediately. Dear Mrs. Wheeler, don't quibble with me. I know you didn't do it. Oh, yes, I did, Jeff. Who else could it have been? And, too, you know about the bugler, don't you? Yes. Well, that's what made me do it. You see, I thought if a death occurred that it would be the death the bugler was heralding. And if it wasn't Mr. Appleby, it might have been Dan himself. She leaned forward as she spoke. Her voice dropped to a mere whisper, and her large eyes took on a glassy stare. While her white face was drawn and set with an agonized expression as of a dreadful memory. And you killed Appleby for that reason? cried Alan. Oh, no. I killed him because because her mind seemed to wander oh yes she resumed because he was a menace to dan to my husband for the first time Allen began to doubt her sanity her eyes were wild her fingers nervously interlaced and her speech was jerky and stammering a menace how he asked softly in different ways Mrs. Wheeler returned in a low voice that the listener outside could scarcely hear. Through me, because of something he knew. Through Maida, because of, of something he wanted. And of course through Dan himself, because of that old conditional pardon. What do you mean about Maida? Alan caught at the thing that most impressed him. 
Did old Appleby want to marry Maida? Yes, he did. Of course, neither her father nor I would hear of such a thing. But Mr. Appleby was an insistent man, insistent and inexorable, and he wanted Maida. Mother dear, I want you to come away now, and Maida came into the room. Come, you have talked too long. It does no good to you or to anyone else. Did you call her down, Geoffrey? Yes, and Alan deeply regretted his act. But I want to talk to somebody, Maida. Will you take your mother away and return? Yes, I will. And the girl left the room, guiding the slow footsteps of her mother. When she came back, Alan took her out under the old sycamore. Now, Maida, he said gently, the truth. No matter what it is, you must tell me. We are here alone. That eavesdropping detective can't overhear us. And you must tell me whom you are shielding, and the full details for the crime. I can't tell you all the details, Jeff, the girl returned. They include a secret that is not mine to divulge. You can divulge anything in a crisis like this, Maida. No, I cannot. Before he... Before he died, Mr. Appleby told me something that I will never tell unless my conscience makes me do so. Isn't it a matter of conscience already? I don't know, Jeff. Truly, I can't tell. But much as I am bound by my principles of right, and you know, dear, I am conscientious, I would willingly throw them all to the winds if they interfered with my parents' happiness, well-being, or safety. Let me get this straight, Maida. You would stifle your conscience, would act directly against its dictates for the sake of your parents? Yes, Geoffrey, right or wrong, that's what I should do. Who am I that I should judge you, dear? I know well your lifelong submission to your conscience, even when your inclinations were strong the other way. Now, if you have thrown over principle, honor, conscience, and right for what you consider a stronger motive, I can only accept your decision. But I wish you would confide in me more fully. Do you mean in regard to Mr. Appleby? Of course I mean in regard to Mr. Appleby, and I'm going to ask you, Jeff, to believe what I tell you. Of course I'll do that, Maida. No, you won't want to, but I ask you to believe it implicitly and to act accordingly. Do you promise me this? The girl's face was turned to his. Her great, sorrowful eyes were full of dumb agony and showed unshed tears, but her voice was clear and strong as one whose purpose was unshakable. Yes, dear and Geoffrey took her hands in his and looked deep into her eyes, whose blank despair haunted him long after. Yes, Maida, I promise. Well, then, I killed Mr. Appleby, and you must do whatever you think best for us all. What shall we do first, Geoffrey? And with the clutch of an icy dread at his heart, Alan replied brokenly, I don't know, Maida, darling, but I will find out what is best, and we will do it. End of chapter 9、chapter、Ten of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phantom Bugler. The day after the funeral of Samuel Appleby, Keefe returned to Sycamore Ridge. I came, Mr. Wheeler, he said, to offer you my services. I express no opinion as to who killed Mr. Appleby, but I do know that his son is going to use every means to discover his father's murderer, and I can't help thinking you'd be wise to let me take up your case. As a criminal lawyer? Asked Dan Wheeler quietly. No, sir, as a friend and adviser. If you find you need a criminal lawyer, I'll suggest one, and a good one. 
but i mean i'd like to help you in a general way by consultation and advice you if you will pardon me have lived so long out of the modern world that you are unfitted to cope with this whole situation i speak frankly because i am deeply interested just why are you so deeply interested mr keefe wheeler's tone was kindly but his glance was sharp at his would-be benefactor i may as well own up keefe said i am hard hit by your daughter oh yes i know she is engaged to young allen and i've no hope she would ever throw him over for me but i'm anxious to serve her in any way i can and i feel pretty sure that i can be of help to you and your family well spoken young man and your promises are right i am out of touch with the world and i should be glad indeed of the advice of an experienced man of business but first of all will you tell me who you think killed appleby i will sir i've no idea it was any of you three people who have all confessed to the deed in order to shield one another whom then do you suspect an outside intruder i have held to this theory from the start and i am sure it is the true one moreover i think the murderer is the man who blew the bugle the phantom bugler no phantom but a live man phantoms do not blow on bugles except in old english legends a bugle sounded in new england and heard by several people was blown by human lungs find your bugler and you found your murderer i wonder if you can be right wheeler fell into a brown study and keefe watched him closely his bugler theory was offered in an effort to find out what wheeler thought of it and wheeler's response ought to show whether his own knowledge of the murder precluded the bugler or not apparently it did for he sighed and said of course the person who sounded the bugle was a live person but i cannot think it had any connection with mr appleby's death even granting someone might have been wicked enough to try to frighten my wife yet there is no reason to think anyone wishing to kill samuel appleby would know of the old legend in mrs wheeler's family true enough but it is possible and in my opinion that is the only direction to look but what direction how can you find out who blew that bugle i don't know yet but i shall try to find out as a matter of fact very little inquiry has been made those two detectives while intelligent enough don't have a very wide horizon they've concluded that the assassin was well was named wheeler and they're only concerned to discover the first name forgive my plain speaking but to save yourself and the other two we must be outspoken yes yes pray don't hesitate to say anything you think i am in a terrible position mr keefe more terrible than you can know and while i'm willing to make any sacrifice for my dear ones it may be in vain the two men had been alone in the den but now were joined by burden and young allen glad to see you back mr keefe burden said usually we detectives don't hanker after outside help but you've a good keen mind and i notice you generally put your finger on the right spot all right burden we'll work together now mr wheeler i'm going to ask you to leave us for there are some details to discuss dan wheeler was only too glad to be excused and with a sigh of relief he went away to his upstairs quarters now it's this way keefe began i've been sounding mr wheeler but i didn't get any real satisfaction but here's a point either he did or didn't kill mr appleby but in either case he's in bad what do you mean asked allen why i've inquired about among the servants and adding our own testimony i figured it out that mr wheeler was either the murderer or he was over the line on the other side of the house and in that case has broken his parole and is subject to the law 
"'How do you prove that?' inquired Burden, interestedly. "'By the story of Miss Wheeler, who says her father was not in the den at all at the time Mr. Appleby was shot. Now, as we know, Mrs. Wheeler ran downstairs at that time, and she, too, says her husband was not in the den. Also, she says he was not in the living room nor in the hall. This leaves only her own sitting room, from which Mr. Wheeler could see the fire and into which he was most likely to go for that purpose. He wouldn't go in that room for any purpose, declared Allen. Not ordinarily, but in the excitement of a fire, men can scarcely refrain from running to look at it, and if he was not in the places he had a right to be, he must have been over on the forbidden ground. So it comes back to this. Either Mr. Wheeler was the murderer, and his wife and daughter have perjured themselves to save him, or he was in a place which, by virtue of the conditions, cancels his pardon. This, I take it, explains Mr. Wheeler's present perplexed state of mind, for he is bewildered and worried in many ways. Well, said Allen, where does this all lead us? It leads us, Keefe returned, to the necessity of a lot of hard work. I'm willing to go on record as desiring to find a criminal outside of the Wheeler family. Or, to put it bluntly, I want to acquit all three of them, even if— Even if one is guilty? said Burden. Well, yes, just that. But of course I don't mean to hang an innocent man. What I want is to get a verdict for persons unknown. I'm with you, said Allen. It's all wrong, I know, but— well i can't believe any of the wheelers really did it you do believe it though keefe turned on him sharply and what's more you believe the criminal is the one of the three whom you least want it to be keefe's meaning was unmistakable and allen's flushed and crestfallen face betrayed his unwilling assent unable to retort even unable to speak he quickly left the room Keefe closed the door and turned to Burden. That was a test, he said. I'm not sure whether Allen suspects Miss Wheeler or not. He sure acts as if he does, Burden said, his face drawn with perplexity. But, I say, Mr. Keefe, haven't you ever thought it might have been Jeffrey Allen himself? Who did the shooting? Yes. He had all the motives the others had, but not the opportunity. Why, he was at the garage fire, where I was. Yes, but he might have got away long enough for— Nonsense, man, nothing of the sort. We were together, fighting the flames. The two chauffeurs were with us, the Wheeler's man and Mr. Appleby's. We used those chemical extinguishers. I know all that, but then— he might have slipped away, and in the excitement you didn't notice. Not a chance. No, take my word for it. The three wheelers were the exclusive suspects, unless we can work in that bugler individual. It's too many for me, Burden sighed. And Hallen, he's at his wit's end. But you're clever at such things, sir, and Mr. Appleby, he's going to get a big detective from the city. You don't seem to mind being discarded. No, sir. If anybody's to fasten a crime on one of those wheelers, I don't want to be the one to do it. Look here, Burden. How about wheelers doing it in self-defense? I know a lot about those two men, and Appleby was just as much interested in getting Wheeler out of his way as vice versa. If Appleby attacked and Wheeler defended, we can get him off easy. Maybe so, but it's all speculation, Mr. Keefe. What we ought to get is evidence, testimony, and that's hard. For the only people to ask about it are, are the criminals themselves. The suspected criminals. Yes, sir. There are others. Have you quizzed all the servants? I don't take much stock in servants' stories. You're wrong there, my man. 
that principle is a good one in ordinary matters but when it comes to a murder case a servant's testimony is as good as his master's burden made no direct response to keith's suggestion but he mulled it over in his slow-going mind and as a result he had a talk with rachel who was lady's maid to both maida and her mother the girl bridled a little when burden began to question her nobody seemed to think it worth while to ask me anything she said so i held my tongue but if so be you want information you ask and i'll answer i doubt if she really knows anything burden thought to himself judging from her air of self-importance but he said tell me anything you know of the circumstances at the time of the murder circumstances repeated rachel wrinkling her brow yes for instance where was mrs wheeler when you heard the shot i didn't say i heard the shot didn't you yes go on then don't be foolish or you'll be sorry for it well then mrs wheeler was downstairs she had just left her room here let me get this story straight how long had she been in her room were you there with her yes we had been there half an hour or so then we heard noise and excitement and a cry of fire mrs wheeler rushed out of her room and ran downstairs and i followed naturally yes and what did you see nothing special i saw a blaze of light through the front door the north door of course the one toward the garage and i saw the garage was on fire so i thought of nothing else then then what did you think of later i remember that i saw mr wheeler in the living room in the north end of it where he never goes you know about his restrictions oh yes sir the servants all know we have to well it was natural poor man that he should go to look at the fire you're sure of this rachel sure yes but don't let's tell for it might get the master in trouble on the contrary it may get him out of trouble to break his parole is not as serious a crime as murder and if he was in the north end of the living room he couldn't have been in the den shooting mr appleby that's true enough and neither could mrs wheeler have done it why not well that is she was right ahead of me did you keep her in sight no i was so excited myself i ran past her and out to the garage who was there mr allen and mr keefe and the two chauffeurs and the head gardener and well most all the servants the men were fighting the fire and the women were standing back looking on yelling i suppose no they were mostly quiet cook was screaming but nobody paid any attention to her the fire was soon over yes it was a little one i suppose that chauffeur of mr appleby's dropped a match or something for our servants are too well trained to do anything of the sort we're all afraid of fire well the fire amounted to little as you say curious it should occur at the time of the murder curious indeed sir do you make anything out of that can't see anything in it unless the murderer started the fire to distract attention from himself in that case it couldn't have been any of the wheelers that it couldn't they were all in the house miss maida did you see her at the time i caught a glimpse of her as i ran through the hall where was she in the den standing near the bay window well we pretty well planted the three mrs wheeler on the stairs mr wheeler you say in the living room where he had no right to be and miss maida oh miss maida didn't do it she couldn't that lovely young lady there rachel that will do you've given your testimony now it's not for you to pass judgment go about your business and keep a quiet tongue no babbling you understand yes sir and the maid went away her attitude still one of importance and her face wearing a vague smile meanwhile curtis keefe was having a serious talk with maida his attitude was kindly and deferential 
but he spoke with a determined air as he said miss wheeler you know i am sure how much i want to help you and how glad i will be if i can do so but first of all i must ask you a question what did mr appleby mean when he said to you something about keefe and the airship maida looked at him with a troubled glance for a minute she did not speak then she said calmly i am not at liberty to tell you what we were talking about then mr keefe but don't you remember mr appleby said that you were not the keefe referred to i know he said that but i don't believe it i am not responsible for your disbelief she drew herself up with a dignified air and i must ask you not to refer to that matter again don't take that attitude he begged at least tell me what keefe he did mean there can be no breach of confidence in that why do you want to know because i know mr appleby had a big airship project under consideration because i know he contemplated letting me in on the deal and it was a most profitable deal had he lived i should have asked him about it but since he is dead i admit i want to know anything you can tell me of the matter involuntarily maida smiled a little and the lovely face usually so sad seemed more beautiful than ever to the man who looked at her why do you smile he cried but whatever the reason keep on doing so oh maida how wonderful you are a glance of astonishment made him quickly apologize for his speech but he said i couldn't help it forgive me miss wheeler and since you can smile over it i'm more than ever anxious to know about the airship deal and i can tell you nothing she declared because i know nothing of any such matter if mr appleby was interested in an airship project i know nothing of it the matter he mentioned to me was i am positively certain not the deal you speak of i believe that your face is too honest for you to speak an untruth so convincingly and now assure me that i am not the keef he referred to and i will never open the subject again but miss maida could not say truthfully and though she tried her assertion was belied by drooping eyes and quivering lips you were not she uttered but she did not look at him and this time Curtis Keefe did not believe her. I was, he said calmly, but he made no further effort to get the full truth from her. I'm sorry you can't confide fully in me, but I shall doubtless learn all I want to know from Mr. Appleby's papers. You, you have them in charge? Maida asked, quite evidently agitated at the thought. Yes, of course, I'm his confidential secretary that's why miss wheeler it's better for you to be frank with me in all things has it never occurred to you that i'm the man who can best help you in this whole moil of troubles why no she said slowly i don't believe it ever has then realize it now truly dear miss wheeler i am not only the one who can best help you but i am the only one who can help you at all please try to see that why should i want help for half a dozen very good reasons first i suppose you know that you are in no enviable position regarding the death of mr appleby oh i know you didn't kill him but i did if you did you couldn't take it so calmly how dare you say i take it calmly what do you know about it just because i don't go about in hysterics that's not my nature is no sign that i'm not suffering tortures you poor sweet child i know you are oh little girl dear little girl can't you won't you let me look out for you the words were right enough but the tone in which they were uttered the look that accompanied them frightened maida she knew at once how this man regarded her intuition told her it was better not to rescind his speech or meaning 
so she only said quietly look out for me how every way give yourself to me be my own own little maida mr keith stop you forget you are talking to an engaged girl i did forget please forgive me in a moment he was humble and penitent i lost my head no miss wheeler i ask no reward i want to help you in any and every way remembering you are to be the bride of mr allen only after i'm acquitted of this crime they never convict a woman do they mr keefe so that's what you're banking on and safely too no miss wheeler no judge or jury would ever convict you of murder but all the same it's a mighty unpleasant process that brings about your acquittal and i advise you not to go through with it but i've got to i've confessed my crime now they have to try me don't they you innocent baby unless look here you're not er stringing me are you what do you mean i mean you didn't really do the job did you i did the calm glance of despair might have carried conviction to a less skeptical hearer but keefe only looked puzzled i can't quite make you out he declared either you're a very brave heroine or or queried maida or you're nutty maida laughed outright that's it she said and her laughter became a little hysterical i am nutty and i own up to it do you think we can enter a plea of insanity keefe looked at her a new thought dawning in his mind that might not be at all a bad plan he said slowly are you in earnest i don't know honestly i think of so many plans and discard them one after the other but i don't want to be convicted and you shan't there are more persons in this world than the three wheelers and one of them may easily be the murderer we're seeking which one asked maida the phantom bugler returned keefe end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fleming Stone. Next day brought the advent of two men and a boy to Sycamore Ridge. Samuel Appleby, determined to discover the murderer of his father and convinced that it was none of the Wheeler family, had brought Fleming Stone, the detective, to investigate the case stone had a young assistant who always accompanied him and this lad terence mcguire by name was a lively irrepressible chap with red hair and freckles but his quick thinking and native wit rendered him invaluable to stone who had already hinted that mcguire might some day become his successor the wheeler family jeffrey allen curtis keefe and burden the local detective were all gathered in mr wheeler's den to reaccount the whole story to fleming stone with grave attention stone listened and young mcguire eagerly drank in each word as if committing a lesson to memory which indeed he was for stone depended on his helper to remember all facts theories and suggestions put forward by the speakers long experience had made fleming stone a connoisseur in cases and by a classification of his own he divided them into express and local by this distinction he meant that in the former cases he arrived quickly at the solution without stop or hindrance the latter kind involved necessary stops even side issues and a generally impeded course by reason of conflicting motives and tangled clues as he listened to the story unfolded by the members of the party he sighed for he knew this was no lightning express affair he foresaw much investigation ahead of him and he already suspected false evidence and perhaps bribed witnesses 
yet these conclusions of his were based quite as much on intuition as on evidence and stone did not wholly trust intuition samuel appleby was the principal spokesman as he was the one chiefly concerned in the discovery of the criminal and the avenging of his father's death moreover he was positive the deed had not been done by any of the wheeler family and he greatly desired to prove himself right in this but you were not here at the time mr appleby stone said and i must get the story from those who were mr keefe you came with mr appleby senior and also as his confidential secretary you were in a position to know of his mental attitudes had he to your knowledge any fear any premonition of evil befalling him not at all answered keefe promptly if he had i do not know of it but i think i can affirm that he had not for when mr appleby was anxious he always showed it in many ways it was noticeable if he had a perplexity on his mind in such a case he was irritable quick-tempered and often absent-minded the day we came down here mr appleby was genial affable and in a kindly mood this to my mind quite precludes the idea that he looked for anything untoward how did he impress you mr wheeler stone went on you had not seen him for some time i believe not for fifteen years dan wheeler spoke calmly and with an air of determined reserve our meeting was such as might be expected between two long-time enemies but appleby was polite and so was i he came to ask a favor of you rather to drive a bargain he offered me a full pardon in return for my assistance in his son's political campaign you i am sure know all this from mr appleby the son yes i do i'm asking you if mr appleby the father showed in his conversation with you any apprehension or gave any intimation of a fear of disaster mr stone returned wheeler i have confessed that i killed mr appleby i hold therefore that i need say nothing that will influence my own case well you see mr wheeler this case is unusual perhaps unique in that three people have confessed to the crime so far i am preserving an open mind though it is possible you and your wife and daughter acted in collusion only one of you could have fired the fatal shot yet you all three claim to have done so there is no conclusion to be drawn from this but that one is guilty and the other two are shielding that one draw any conclusion you wish said wheeler still imperturbably but i've no objection to replying to the question you ask me sam appleby said no word to me that hinted at a fear for his personal safety if he had any such fear he kept it to himself he knew of your enmity toward him of course he did me an unforgivable injustice and i never pretended that i did not resent it and you refused to meet his wishes regarding his son's campaign i most certainly did for the same reasons i opposed his own election many years ago yes all those details i have from mr appleby jr now mr appleby does not believe that his father was killed by any member of your family mr wheeler can he then produce the man whom he does suspect no he suspects no one definitely but he thinks that by investigation i can find out the real criminal you may as well save your time and trouble mr stone i am the man you seek i freely confess my crime and i accept my fate whatever it be can i do more yes if you are telling the truth go on and relate details what weapon did you use my own revolver where is it i threw it out of the window which window the the bay window in my den in this room yes that window there stone pointed to the big bay yes 
you were sitting there at the time of the shot were you not miss wheeler stone turned to maida who white-faced and trembling listened to her father's statements i was sitting there before the shot the girl returned speaking in quiet steady tones though a red spot burned in either cheek and then when mr appleby threatened my father i shot him myself my father is untruthful for my sake in his love for me he is trying to take my crime on himself oh believe me mr stone others can testify that i said long ago that i could willingly kill mr appleby he has made my dear father's life a living grave he has changed a brilliant capable man of affairs to a sad and broken-hearted recluse a man who had everything to live for everything to interest and occupy his mind was condemned to a solitary imprisonment save for the company of his family my father's career would have been notable celebrated but that samuel appleby put an end to fifteen years ago for no reason but petty spite and mean revenge i had never seen the man save as a small child and when i learned he was at last coming here my primitive passions were stirred my sense of justice awoke and my whole soul was absorbed in a wild impulse to rid the world of such a demon in human form i told my parents i was capable of killing him they reproved me so i said no more but i brooded over the project and made ready and then when mr appleby threatened my father talked to him brutally scathingly fairly turning the iron in his soul i could stand it no longer and i shot him down as i would have killed a venomous serpent i do not regret the act though i do fear the consequences maida almost collapsed but pulled herself together to add that is the truth you must disregard and disbelieve my father's noble efforts to save me by trying to pretend the crime was his own stone looked at her pityingly mcguire stared fixedly the boy's eyes round with amazement at this outburst of self-condemnation then stone said almost casually you too mrs wheeler confessed to this crime i believe i am the real criminal sarah wheeler asserted speaking very quietly but with a steady gaze into the eyes of the listening detective you can readily understand that my husband and daughter are trying to shield me when i tell you that only i had opportunity i had possessed myself of mr wheeler's pistol and as i ran downstairs well knowing the conversation that was going on i shot through the doors as i passed and running on threw the weapon far out into the shrubbery it can doubtless be found i must beg of you mr stone that you thoroughly investigate these three stories and i assure you you will find mine the true one and the assertions of my husband and daughter merely loving but futile attempts to save me from the consequences of my act fleming stone smiled a queer tender little smile it is certainly a new experience for me he said when a whole family insists on being considered criminals but i will reserve decision until i can look into matters a little more fully now who can give me any information on the matter outside of the identity of the criminal geoffrey allen volunteered the story of the fire and keefe told of the strange bugle call that had been heard you heard it mr keefe asked stone after listening to the account no i was with mr appleby on a trip to boston i tell it as i heard the tale from the household here whereupon the wheeler family corroborated keefe's story and fleming stone listened attentively to the various repetitions you find that bugler and you've got your murderer curtis keefe said bluntly you agree don't you mr stone that it was no phantom who blew audible notes on a bugle i most certainly agree to that i've heard many legends in foreign countries 
of ghostly drummers buglers and bagpipers but they are merely legends i've never found anyone who really heard the sounds and moreover those things aren't even legends in america any bugling done in this country is done by human lungs now this bugler interests me i think with you mr keefe that to know his identity would help us whether he proves to be the criminal or not he's the criminal keefe declared again forgive me mr stone if my certainty seems to you presumptuous or forward but i'm so thoroughly convinced of the innocence of the wheeler family that perhaps i am over enthusiastic in my theory a theory doesn't depend on enthusiasm returned stone but on evidence and proof now how can we set about finding this mysterious bugler whether phantom or human i thought that's what you're here to do sam appleby said looking helplessly at fleming stone we are piped up terence mcguire as stone made no reply that's our business and consequently it shall be done the boy assumed an air of importance that was saved from being objectionable by his good-humored face and frank serious eyes i'll just start in and get busy now he went on and rising he bobbed a funny little bow that included all present and left the room it was mid-afternoon and as they looked out on the wide lawn they saw mcguire strolling slowly hands in pockets and seemingly more absorbed in the birds and flowers than in his vaunted business perhaps mcguire needs a little explanation stone smiled he is my right-hand man and a great help in detail work but he has a not altogether unearned reputation for untruthfulness indeed his nickname is fibsy because of a congenital habit of telling fibs i advise you of this because i prefer you should not place implicit confidence in his statements but mr stone cried maida greatly interested how can he be of any help to you if you can't depend on what he says oh he doesn't lie to me stone assured her nor does he tell whoppers at any time only it's his habit to shade the truth when it seems to him advisable i do not defend this habit in fact i have persuaded him to stop it to a degree but you know how hard it is to reform entirely it won't affect his usefulness since he doesn't lie to his employer appleby said and too it's none of our business i've engaged mr stone to solve the mystery of my father's death and i'm prepared to give him full powers he may conduct his investigations on any plan he chooses my only stipulation is that he shall find a criminal outside the wheeler family a difficult and somewhat unusual stipulation remarked stone why difficult dan wheeler said quickly because with three people confessing a crime and no one else even remotely suspected save a mysterious and perhaps mythical bugle player it does not seem an easy job to hunt up and then hunt down a slayer but you'll do it begged appleby almost pleadingly for it must be done we'll see stone replied and now tell me more about the fire in the garage it occurred at the time of the shooting you say what started it but nobody knew what started it how could we know asked jeff allen it was only a small fire and the most it burned was the robe in mr appleby's own car and a motor coat that was also in the car whose coat asked stone mine said keefe ruefully a bit of bad luck too for it was a new one i had to get another in place of it and you think the fire was the result of a dropped cigarette or match by mr appleby's chauffeur i don't know returned keefe he denies it of course but it must have been that or an incendiary act of some one maybe the bugler person suggested stone maybe assented keefe 
though he did not look convinced. "'I think Mr. Keefe thinks it was the work of my own men,' said Dan Wheeler. "'And it may have been. There's one in my employ who has an ignorant, brutal spirit of revenge. And if he thought Samuel Appleby was inimical to me, he would be quite capable of setting fire to the Appleby car. That may be the fact of the case. It may be, agreed Stone. Doubtless we can find out. How? asked Allen. That would be magician's work, I think. A detective has to be a magician, Stone smiled at him. We quite often do more astounding tricks than that. Go to it, then, cried Appleby. That's the talk I like to hear. Questions and answers any of us can put over, but the real detecting is like magic. At least I can't see how it's done. Duff in, Mr. Stone. Get busy. The group dispersed then, Fleming Stone going to his room and the others straying off by twos or threes. Burden, who had said almost nothing during the confab, declared he wanted a talk with the great detective alone and would await his pleasure. So Burden sat by himself, brooding on the veranda, and presently saw the boy, Fibsy, returning toward the house. "'Come here, young one,' Burden called out. "'Nixie, old one,' was the saucy retort. "'Why not?' in a conciliatory tone. "'Cause you spoke disrespectful-like. I'm a detective, you know.' "'All right, old pal. Come here, will you?' Fibsy grinned and came, seating himself on a cushioned swing nearby. "'What you want?' he demanded. "'Only a line of talk. You're Mr. Stone now. Do you think he'll show up soon, or has he gone for a nap?' "'Fleming Stone doesn't take naps,' Fibsy said disdainfully. "'He isn't that sort.' "'Then he'll be down again shortly?' "'Don't know.' Maybe he's begun his fasting and prayer over this phenomenal case. Does he do that? How do I know? I'm not of a curious turn of mind. Me having other sins to answer for. I know. Mr. Stone told us you have no respect for the truth. Did he now? Well, he's some mistaken. I have such a profound respect for the truth that I never use it except on very special occasions. Is this one? It is not. Don't believe a word I say just now. In fact, I'm so lit up with the beauties and glories of this place that I hardly know what I am a-saying. Ain't it the show place, though? Yes, it is. Looky here, youngster, can't you go up and coax Mr. Stone to see me just a few minutes? Nope, can't do that. But you spill it to me, and if it's worth it, I'll repeat it to him. I'm really along for that purpose, you see. But I haven't anything special to tell him. Oh, I see. Just want the glory and honor of chinning with the great stone. As this so nearly expressed Burden's intention, he grinned sheepishly, and Fibsy understood. No go, old top, he assured him. F. Stone will send for you if he thinks you'd interest him in the slightest degree. Better wait for the sending. It'll mean a more satisfactory interview all round. Well, then, let's you and me chat a bit. Oh, ho, coming round to sort of like me, are you? Well, I'm willing. Tell me this. How far from the victim did the shooter stand? The doctor said, as nearly as he could judge, about ten feet or so away. Hmm, and Fibsy looked thoughtful. That would just about suit all three of the present claimants for the honor, wouldn't it? Yes, and would preclude anybody not inside the room. Unless he was close to the window. Sure, but it ain't likely, is it now? that a rank outsider would come right up to the window and fire through it and not be seen by anybody. No, it isn't. And, of course, if that had happened, and any one of the three wheelers had seen it, they would be only too glad to tell of it. I wonder they haven't made up some such yarn as that. You don't know the wheelers. I do, and I can see how they would perjure themselves, any of them, 
and confess to a crime they didn't commit to save each other but it wouldn't occur to them to invent a murderer or to say they saw someone they didn't see do you get the difference being an expert in the lying game i do and fibsy winked it isn't only that it's not only that they're unwilling to lie about it but they haven't the the well ingenuity to contrive a plausible yarn not being lying experts just as i said fibsy observed well we all have our own kind of cleverness now mine is finding things want to see an example yes i do all right how far did you say the shooter person stood from his victim about ten feet but i dare say it might be two or three feet more or less no they can judge closer than that by the powder marks the truth wouldn't vary more in a foot or so from their say now supposing the shooter did throw the revolver out of the bay window as the three wheelers agree severally they did do where would it most likely land in that clump of rhododendrons yep if they threw it straight ahead i suppose you've looked there for it yes rake the place thoroughly all right now if they slung the thing over toward the right where would it land on the smooth lawn and you didn't find it there no what are you doing stringing me oh no sir oh no now once again if they chanced to fling said revolver far to the left where would it land why in that big bed of ferns if they threw it far enough looked there no i haven't come on let's take a squint fibsy rose and lounged over toward the fern bed burden following almost certain he was being made game of End of chapter 11chapter twelve of the mystery of the sycamore by carolyn wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain the garage fire now watch me he said and with a quick thrust of his arm down among the ferns he drew forth a revolver which he turned over to burden land a goodness exclaimed that worthy how'd you know it was there knew it must be looked for it saw it returned the boy nonchalantly and then hearing a short sharp whistle he looked up at the house to see fleming stone regarding him from an upper window found the weapon fibs he inquired yes mr stone all right bring it up here and ask mr burden to come along delighted at the summons burden followed the boy's flying feet and they went up to stone's rooms a small and pleasant sitting-room had been given over to the detective and he admitted his two visitors then closed the door doing the spectacular terence stone said smiling a little just one grandstand play the boy confessed as a matter of fact he had located the pistol some time earlier but waited to make the discovery seem sensational all right let's take a look at it without hesitation burden pronounced the revolver mr wheeler's it had no initials on it but from wheeler's minute description burden recognized it beyond reasonable doubt one bullet had been fired from it and the caliber corresponded to the shot that had killed samuel appleby oh it's the right gun all right burden said but i never thought of looking over that way for it must have been thrown by a left-handed man oh not necessarily said stone but it was thrown with a conscious desire to hide it and not flung away in a careless or preoccupied moment and what do you deduce from that asked burden quite prepared to hear the description of the murderer's physical appearance and mental attainments nothing very definite stone mused we might say it looked more like the act of a strong-willed man such as mr wheeler than of a frightened and nervously agitated woman if either of those two women did it burden offered she wasn't nervous or agitated they're not that sort 
they may go to pieces afterward but whatever mrs wheeler or maida undertake to do they put it all over all right i've known em for years and i never knew either of them to show the white feather well it was not much of an indication anyway stone admitted but it does prove a steady nerve and a planning brain that would realize the advisability of flinging the weapon where it would not be probably sought now as this is mr wheeler's revolver there's no use asking the three suspects anything about it for each has declared he or she used it and flung it away that in itself is odd i mean that they should all tell the same story it suggests not collusion so much as the idea that whoever did the shooting was seen by one or both of the others then you believe it was one of the three wheelers asked burden i don't say that yet returned stone but they must be reckoned with i want to eliminate the innocent two and put the guilt on the third if that is where it belongs and if not which way are you looking toward the fire that most opportune fire in the garage seems to me indicative of a criminal who wanted to create a panic so he could carry out his murderous design with neatness and dispatch and that lets out the women not if as you say they're of the daring and capable sort oh they are if maida wheeler did this thing she could stage the fire easily enough or mrs wheeler could either they're hummers when it comes to efficiency and actually doing things you surprise me mrs wheeler seems such a gentle delicate personality yep till she's roused then she's full of tiger oh i know sarah wheeler you ask my wife what mrs wheeler can do tell me a little more of this conditional pardon matter is it possible that for fifteen years mr wheeler has never stepped over to the forbidden side of his own house perfectly true but it isn't his house it's mrs wheeler's her folks are connected with the applebys and it was the work of old appleby that the property came to sarah with that tag attached that she must live in massachusetts also appleby pardoned wheeler on condition that he never stepped foot into massachusetts and there they were it was sarah wheeler's ingenuity and determination that planned the house on the state line and she has seen to it that dan wheeler never broke parole it's second nature to him now of course but i'm told that he did step over the night of the murder that he went into the sitting-room of his wife or maybe into the forbidden end of that long living-room to see the fire it would be a most natural thing for him to do not natural no sir burden rubbed his brow thoughtfully yet he might a done it but one misstep like that ought to be overlooked i think and would be by his friends but suppose there's an enemy at work suppose just as a theory that somebody is ready to take advantage of the peculiar situation that seems to prove dan wheeler was either outside his prescribed territory or he was the murderer to my way of thinking at present that man's alibi is his absence from the scene of the crime and if he was absent he must have been over the line i know this from talks i've had with the servants and the family and guests and i'm pretty confident that wheeler was either in the den or in the forbidden north part of the house at the moment of the murder why don't you know which it was asked burden bluntly because said stone not resenting the question because i can't place any dependence on the truth of the family's statements for three respectable god-fearing citizens they are most astonishingly willing even eager to perjure themselves of course i know they do it for one another's sake they have a strange conscience that allows them to lie outright for the sake of a loved one and it may be commit murder for the sake of a loved one but all this i shall straighten out when i get further along the case is so widespread so full of ramifications and possible side issues i have to go carefully at first and not get entangled in false clues got any clues sir any real ones 
"'Meaning dropped handkerchiefs and broken cufflinks?' Stone chafed him. "'Well, there's the pistol. That's a material clue. But no, I can't produce anything else, at present. Well, Terence, what luck?' Fibsy, who had slipped from the room at the very beginning of this interview, now returned. "'It's puzzling. That's what it is, puzzling,' he declared, throwing himself astride of a chair. "'I've raked that old garage fore and aft, but I can't track down the startings of that fire. You see, the place is stucco and all that, and besides, the discipline of this whole layout is along the lines of prison neatness.' everybody that works at sycamore height has to be a very old maid for keeping things clean so there's no chance for accumulated rubbish or old rags or spontaneous combustion or anything of the sort nextly none of the three men who have any call to go into the garage ever smoke in there that's a mead and persian law gee mr wheeler is some efficient boss well, anyway, after the fire, though they tried every way to find out what started it, they couldn't find a thing. There was no explanation but a brand dropped from the skies, or a stroke of lightning, and there was no storm on. It wouldn't all be so sure, but the morning after, it seems, Mr. Allen and Mr. Keefe were doing some sleuthing on their own, and they couldn't find out how the fire started. So they put it up to the garage men, and they hunted, too. It seems nothing was burnt but some things in Mr. Appleby's car, which, of course, lets out his chauffeur, who had no call to burn up his own duds. And a coat of his was burned, and also a coat of Mr. Keefe's. "'What were those coats doing in an unused car?' asked Stone. "'Oh, they were extra motor coats, or raincoats, or something like that, and they always stayed in the car.' where in the car i asked that fibsy returned and they were hanging on the coat rail i thought there might have been matches in the pockets but they say no there never had been matches in those coat pockets nor any matches in the appleby car for that matter well the fire is pretty mixed up in the murder declared stone now it's up to us to find out how excuse me mr stone and burden shook his head you'll never get at it that way excuse me mr burden fibsy flared back mr stone will get at it that way if he thinks that's the way to look you don't know f stone yet hush up fibs mr burden will know if i succeed and perhaps he's right as to the unimportance of the fire after all you see burton went on unabashed mr keefe now he's some smart in the detective line he said find your phantom bugler and you've got your murder now what nonsense that is as if a marauding villain would announce himself by playing on a bugle yet there may be something in it demurred stone it may well be that the dramatic mind that staged this whole mysterious affair is responsible for the bugle call the fire and the final crime in that case it's one of the women burton said they could do all that either of them if they wanted to but dan wheeler while he could kill a man on provocation it would be an impulsive act not a premeditated one no sir wheeler could see red and go berserk but he couldn't plan out a complicated affair like you're turning this case into i'm not turning it into anything stone laughed i'm taking it as it is presented to me but i do hold that the phantom bugler and the opportune fire are theatrical elements a theatrical element too is the big sycamore and burden smiled now if that tree should take a notion to walk over into massachusetts it would help out some what's that cried fibsy what do you mean well the wheelers have got a letter from appleby written while he was still governor and it says that when the big sycamore goes into massachusetts wheeler can go too but it can't be done by trick i mean they can't transplant the thing or chop it down and take the wood over it's got to go of its own accord mere teasing said stone 
yes sir just that appleby had a great streak of teasing he used to tease everybody just for the fun of seeing them squirm this whole wheeler business was the outcome of appleby's distorted love of fun and wheeler took it so seriously that appleby kept it up i'll warrant if wheeler had treated the whole thing as a joke appleby would have let up on him but dan wheeler is a solemn old chap and he saw no fun in the whole matter i don't blame him commented stone won't he get pardoned now no sir he won't some folks think he will but i know better the present governor isn't much for pardoning old sentences he says it establishes precedent and all that and the next governor is more likely to say the same i hear young mr appleby isn't going to run no sir he ain't though i dare say he will some other time but this death of his father and the mystery and all is no sort of help to a campaign and two young appleby hasn't the necessary qualifications to conduct a campaign however good he might be as governor after he got elected no sam won't run who will don't know i'm sure but there'll be lots ready and eager for a try at it i suppose so well burden i'm going down now to ask some questions of the servants you know they're a mind of information usually can i go asked fibsy not now son you stay here or do what you like but don't say much and don't antagonize anybody not me f stone well don't shock anybody then behave like a gentleman and a scholar yes sir fibsy ducked a comical bow and burden understanding he was dismissed went home to the dining-room stone made his way and asked a maid there if he might see the cook greatly frightened the waitress brought the cook to the dining-room but the newcomer a typical strong-armed strong-minded individual was not at all abashed what is it you do be wantin sir she asked civilly enough but a trifle sullenly only a few answers to direct questions where were you when you first heard the alarm of the garage fire i was in me kitchen cleanin up after dinner what did you do i ran out the kitchen door and see in flames i ran toward the garage before you ran you were at the rear of the house i mean the south side weren't you yes sir i was you passed along the south veranda not along it the cook looked at him wonderingly but by the end of it like and did you see any one on the veranda any one at all the woman thought hard well i should have said no first off but now you speak of it i must say i do have a remembrance of seeing a figure but sort of vague like you mean your memory of it is vague you don't mean a shadowy figure no sir i mean i can't mind it rightly now for i was thinking entirely of the fire and so as i was running past the end of the verandy all i can say is i just glimpsed like a person standing there standing well he might have been moving i don't know are you sure it was a man i'm not i'm thinking it was but yet i couldn't speak it for sure then you went on to the fire yes sir and thought no more about the person on the veranda no sir and it never would have entered my head again savin your speaking of it now why was it the the man that oh probably not but everything i can learn is of help in discovering the criminal and perhaps freeing your employers from suspicion and i wish that might be to put it on the good man now and worse upon the ladies angels both of them you are fond of the family then i am that i've worked here for eight years and never a cross word from the missus or the master as for miss maida she's my darlint they're fortunate in having you here said stone kindly that's all now cook unless you can remember anything more of that person you saw nothing more sir if i do i'll tell you thinking hard stone left her it was the most unusual case he had ever attempted 
if he looked no further for the murderer than the wheeler family he still had enough to do in deciding which one of the three was guilty but he yearned for another suspect not a foolish phantom that went around piping or a perhaps imaginary prowler stalking on the piazza but a real suspect with a sound plausible motive though to be sure the wheelers had motive enough to be condemned to an absurd restriction and then teased about it was enough to make life gall and wormworth to a sensitive man like wheeler and who could say what words had passed between them at that final interview perhaps appleby had goaded him to the breaking point perhaps wheeler had stood it but his wife descending the stairs and hearing the men talk had grown desperate at last or and stone knew he thought this most plausible of all perhaps maida in her window seat had stood as long as she could the aspersions and tauntings directed at her adored father and had with a reckless disregard of consequences silence the enemy for ever of young allen stone had no slightest suspicion to be sure his interests were one with the wheeler family and moreover he had hoped for a release from restrictions that would let the wheelers go into massachusetts and thereby make possible his home there with maida for maida's vow that she would never go into the state if her father could not go too was allan knew inviolable all this stone mulled over yet had no thought that allan was the one he was seeking also curtis keefe had testified that allan was with him at the fire during the time that included the moment of shooting strolling out into the gardens the detective made his way to the great tree the big sycamore here fibsy joined him and at stone's tactic nod of permission the boy sat down beside his superior on the bench under the tree what's this about the tree going to massachusetts fibsy asked his freckled face earnestly inquiring one of old appleby's jokes stone returned doubtless made just after a reading of macbeth you know or if you don't you must read it up for yourself there's a scene there that hinges on Burgham Wood going into Dernsony. I can't take time to tell you about it, but quite evidently it pleased the old wag to tell Mr. Wheeler that he could go into his native state when this great tree went there. Meaning not at all, I suppose. Of course, and any human intervention was not allowed. So though Burgham Wood was brought to Dernsonane, such a trick is not permissible in his case however that's beside the point just now have you seen any of the servants some but i got nothing they're willing enough to talk but they don't know anything they say i'd better tackle the lady's maid a fair rachel so i'm going for her but i bet i won't strike pay dirt you may skip along now for here comes miss maida and she's probably looking for me Fibsy departed, and Maida, looking relieved to find Stone alone, came quickly toward him. "'You see, Mr. Stone,' she began, "'you must start straight in this thing, and the only start possible is for you to be convinced that I killed Mr. Appleby. But you must admit, Miss Wheeler, that I am not too absurd in thinking that though you say you did it, you are saying it to shield someone else.' someone who is near and dear to you i know you think that but it isn't so how can i convince you only by circumstantial evidence let me question you a bit where did you get the revolver from my father's desk drawer where he always keeps it you are familiar with firearms my father taught me to shoot years ago i'm not a crack shot but that was not necessary you premeditated the deed for some time i have felt that i wanted to kill that man your conscience is very active i deliberately went against its dictates for my father's sake and you killed mr appleby because he hounded your father in addition to the long deprivation he had imposed on him no not that alone oh i don't want to tell you 
but if you won't believe me otherwise mr stone i will admit that i had a new motive a new one yes a secret that i learned only a day or so before before mr appleby's death the secret was appleby's yes that is he knew it he told it to me if anyone else should know it it would mean the utter ruin and desolation of the lives of my parents compared to which this present condition of living is paradise itself this is true miss wheeler absolutely true now do you understand why i killed him end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of the Mystery of the Sycamore by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sarah Wheeler. Fleming Stone was deeply interested in the Appleby case. While his logical brain could see no possible way to look save toward one of the three Wheelers, yet his soul revolted at the thought that any one of them was the criminal stone was well aware of the fact that the least seemingly guilty often proved to be a deeply dyed villain yet he hesitated to think that dan wheeler had killed his old enemy and he could not believe it was a woman's work he was impressed by maida's story especially by the fact that a recent development had made her more strongly desirous to be rid of old appleby he wondered if it did not have something to do with young Appleby's desire to marry her, and determined to persuade her to confide further in him regarding the secret she mentioned. But first he decided to interview Mrs. Wheeler. This could not be done offhand, so he waited a convenient season and asked for a conference when he felt sure it would be granted sarah wheeler received the detective in her sitting-room and her manner was calm and collected as she asked him to make the interview as brief as possible you are not well mrs wheeler stone asked courteously i am not ill mr stone but naturally these dreadful days have upset me and the horror and suspense are still hanging over me can you not bring matters to a crisis anything would be better than present conditions if some member of your family would tell me the truth stone said frankly it would help a great deal you know mrs wheeler when three people insist on being regarded as the criminal it's difficult to choose among them now won't you at least admit that you didn't shoot mr appleby but i did and the serene eyes looked at stone calmly can you prove it i mean to my satisfaction tell me this where did you get a pistol i used mr wheeler's revolver where did you get it from the drawer in his desk where he always keeps it stone sighed of course both maida and her mother knew where the revolver was kept so this was no test of their velocity as to the crime when did you take it from the drawer sarah wheeler hesitated for an instant and from that stone knew that she had to think before she spoke had she been telling the truth he argued she would have answered at once but immediately she spoke though with a shade of hesitation i took it earlier in the day i had it up in my own room yes where did you conceal it there in in a dresser drawer and when you heard the alarm of fire you ran downstairs in consequence but you paused to get the revolver and take it with you this sounded absurd but sarah wheeler could see no way out of it so she assented feeling sure that you would find your husband and mr appleby in such a desperate quarrel that you would be called upon to shoot i i overheard the quarrel from upstairs she faltered her eyes piteous now with a baffled despair then you went down because of the quarrelling voices not because of the fire alarm unable to meet stone's inexorable gaze mrs wheeler's eyes fell and she nervously responded well it was both 
now see here stone said kindly you want to do anything you can don't you to help your husband and daughter yes of course and the wide open eyes now looked at him hopefully then will you trust me far enough to believe that i think you will best help them by telling the truth oh i can't and with a low moan the distracted woman hid her face in her hands please do your attitude proves you are concealing important information i am more than ever sure you are not the guilty one and i am not at all sure that it was either of the other two then who could it have been and sarah wheeler looked amazed that we don't know if i had a hint of any direction to look i'd be glad but if you will shed what light you can it may be of great help even if it seems to incriminate my what can incriminate them more than their own confessions their confessions contradict each other they can't both be guilty and you don't know which one is no came the faltering reply but that admission contradicts your own confession come now mrs wheeler own up to me that you didn't do it and i'll not tell anyone else unless it becomes necessary i will tell you for i can't bear this burden alone any longer i did go downstairs because of the alarm of fire mr stone just before i came to the open door of the den i heard a shot and as i passed the door of the den i saw mr appleby fallen slightly forward in his chair my husband standing at a little distance looking at him and maida in the bay window also staring at them both what did you do go in no i was so bewildered i scarcely knew which way to turn and in my fear and horror i ran into my own sitting-room and fell on the couch there in sheer collapse you stayed there until i heard voices in the den the men came back from the fire and discovered the the tragedy at least i think that's the way it was it's all mixed up in my mind usually i'm very clear-headed and strong-nerved but that scene seemed to take away all my will-power all my vitality i don't wonder what did you do or say i had a vague fear that my husband or daughter would be accused of the crime and so at once i declared it was the work of the phantom bugler you've heard about him yes you didn't think it was he though did you i wanted to yes i think i did you see i don't think the bugler was a phantom but i do think he was a criminal i mean i think it was somebody who meant harm to my husband i well i think maybe the shot was meant for mr wheeler stone looked at her sharply and said please mrs wheeler be honest with me whatever you may pretend to others are you not springing that theory in a further attempt to direct suspicion away from mr wheeler she gave a gesture of helplessness i see i can hide nothing from you mr stone you are right but may there not be a chance that it is a true theory after all possibly if we can find any hint of the bugler's identity mr keith says find the bugler and you found the murderer i know he does but keith is as i am very anxious to direct suspicion away from the wheeler family you see mr keith is in love with my daughter as who isn't all the young men fall down before her charms it is so although she is engaged to mr allen both mr keefe and mr sam appleby are hopeful of yet winning her regard to me it is not surprising for i think maida the very flower of lovely girlhood but i also think those men should recognize geoffrey allen's rights and cease paying maida such definite attentions it is hard to repress an ardent admirer stone admitted and as you say that is probably keefe's intent in insisting on the finding of the bugler you do not then believe in your old legend i do and i don't 
my mind has a tendency to revere and love the old traditions of my family but when it comes to real belief i can't say i'm willing to stand by them yet where else can we look for a criminal other than my own people please tell me just what you saw when you looked into the den immediately after you heard the shot you must realize how important this testimony is i do was the solemn reply i saw as i told you both my husband and daughter looking at mr appleby as he sat in his chair i did not know then that he was dead but he must have been dead or dying the doctors said the death was practically instantaneous and from their attitude or their facial expression could you assume either your husband or daughter to have been the guilty one i can only say they both looked stunned and horrified just as one would expect them to look on the occasion of witnessing a horrible tragedy whether they were responsible for it or not yes but i'm not sure the attitude would have been different in the case of a criminal or a witness i mean the fright and horror i saw on their faces would be the same if they had committed a crime or had seen it done stone considered this you may be right he said i dare say absolute horror would fill the soul in either case and would produce much the same effect in appearance now let us suppose for a moment that one or other of the two did do the shooting wait a moment as mrs wheeler swayed uncertainly in her chair don't faint i'm supposing this only in the interests of you and yours suppose i say that either mr wheeler or miss wheeler had fired the weapon as they both confessed to doing which would you assume from their appearance had done it controlling herself by a strong effort sarah wheeler answered steadily i could not say honestly to my startled eyes they seemed equally horrified and stunned of course they would you see mrs wheeler the fact that they both confess it makes it look as if one of them did do it and the other having witnessed the deed takes over the blame to save the guilty one this sounds harsh but we have to face the facts then if we can get more or different facts so much the better you're suggesting then that one of my people did do it and the other saw it done i'm suggesting that that might be the truth and so far as we can see now is the most apparent solution but i'm not saying it is the truth nor shall i relax my efforts to find another answer to our problem and i want to tell you that you have helped materially by withdrawing your own confession every step i can take toward the truth is helpful you have lessened the suspects from three to two now if i can eliminate another we will have but one and if i can clear that one we shall have to look elsewhere that is specious argument mr stone and sarah wheeler's fixed her large sad eyes upon his face for if you succeeded in elimination of one of the two it may be you cannot eliminate the third and then and then your loving perjuries will be useless true but i must do my duty and that means my duty to you all i may tell you that mr appleby who employed me asked me to find a criminal outside of your family whether the real one or not he put it that way he did and while i do want to find the outside criminal i can't find him if he doesn't exist of course not i dare say i shall regret what i've told you but but you couldn't help it i know don't worry mrs wheeler if you've no great faith in me try to have a hopeful trust and i assure you i will not betray it well mr mcguire stone said to his adoring satellite a little later there's one out mother wheeler yes you young scamp how did you know saw you hobnobbing with her she being took with a sudden attack of the confidentials and anyhow two of them 
at least, has got to cave in. You can fear it out which of them is George Washington's and which isn't. Well, here's the way it seems to stand now. Mind, I only say seems to stand. Yes, sir. The father and daughter, both of whom confessed to the shooting, were seen in the room immediately after the event. Now they were on opposite sides of the room, the victim being about midway between them. Consequently, if one shot, the other was witness thereto, and owing to the deep devotion obtaining between them, either father or daughter would confess to the crime to save the other. Then, Fibsy summed up, Mr. Wheeler and Maida don't suspect each other. One did it, and both know which one. Well put. Now which is which? More likely the girl did the shooting. She's awful impulsive, awful high-strung, and awful fond of her father. Say the old Appleby gentleman was berating or orating or irritating against friend Wheeler, and say he went a little too far for Miss Maida to stand, and say she had that new secret, or whatever it is that's eaten her, well, it wouldn't surprise me overly if she up and shot the varmint. Having held the pistol in readiness? Not necessarily. She could have sprung across the room, lifted the weapon from its customed place in the drawer, and fired all in a fleeting instant a time. And she's the girl to do it. That Maida, now she could do anything. And she loves the old man enough to do anything. Touch and go, that's what she is. Especially go. Well, all right. Yet maybe it was the other way. Maybe Wheeler, at the end of his patience, and knowing the secret, whatever it may be, flung away discretion and grabbed up his own pistol and fired. Could have been, F. Stone, could have been, easily. But I lean to the Maida theory. Maida for mine, first, last, and all the time. For an admirer of hers, and you're not by yourself in that, you seem cheerfully willing to subscribe to her guilt. Well, I ain't, but I do want to get the truth as to the three wheelers, and once I get it fastened on the lovely Maida, I'll set to work to get it off again. But I'll know where I'm at. And suppose we fasten it on the lovely Daniel. That's a serious proposition, F. Stone, for if he did it, he did it, and if Maida did it, she didn't do it. See? Not very clearly, but never mind. You needn't expound. It doesn't interest me. Fibsy looked comically chagrined, as he often did when Stone scorned his ideas, but he said nothing except, Orders, sir? Yes, Terence. Hunt up Rachel, the maid, and find out all she knows. Use your phenomenal powers of enchantment and make her come across. Tis the same as done, sir declared the boy, and he departed at once in search of Rachel. He sauntered out of the north door and took a roundabout way to the kitchen quarters. Finally he found the cook, and putting on his best and most endearing little boy effects, he appealed for something to eat. Not but what I'm well treated at the table, he said, but you know what boys are. I do that and the good-natured woman furnished him with liberal pieces of pie and cake. Great, said Fibsy, eating the last crumb as he guyfully complimented her culinary skill, and now I've got to find a person named a Rachel. Where might she be? She might be most anywhere, but she isn't anywhere, was the cryptic reply. Why for? Well, she's plain disappeared, if you know what that means. Vamoosed, skipped, faded, slid, oozed out? Yes, all those. Anyway, she isn't on the place. Since when? Why, I saw her last about two hours ago. Then when Mrs. Wheeler wanted her, she wasn't to be found. And hasn't since been seen? Just so and as you are part and parcel of that detective layout that's infesting the house and grounds, I wish you'd find the hussy. Why, why, what language? Why call her names? 
she's a caution get along now and if you can't find her at least you can quit bothering me all right but tell me this before we part did she confide to your will and ears anything about the murder uncanny you are lad how'd you guess it i'm a limb of satan what did she tell you and when only this morning early before she flew off couldn't very well have told you after she started no impotence now well she told me that the night of the murder as she ran from here to the garage she saw on the south veranda a man with a bugle pipe a pipe dream i don't know but she told it like gospel truth just what did she say said she saw a man a live man no phantom foolishness on the south veranda and he carried a bugle did he play on it no just carried it like but she says he must have been the murderer and by the same token it's the man i saw oh ho you saw him too as i told your master i saw him but not plain as i ran along to the fire rachel now she saw him plain so he must have been there well be like he was the murderer and that sets my people free important if true but are you both sure and why oh why does the valuable rachel choose this time to vanish won't she come back who knows she didn't take any luggage how did she go nobody knows she walked of course then she couldn't have gone far oh well she could walk to the railway station it's only a fairish tramp but why did she go i ask you why and i don't know but i suppose it was because she didn't want to be questioned about the man who shot what you didn't say she saw him shoot yes i did or i meant to anyway that's what rachel said the man with the bugle shot through the window and that's what killed mr appleby oh come now this is too big a yarn to be true especially when the yarner lights out at once after telling it well rachel has her faults but i never knew her to lie and if it was the man i saw why that proves at least there was a man there but you didn't see him clearly but i saw him then he must be reckoned with now cookie dear we must find rachel we must do you hear you help me and i bet we'll get her but i've no idea where she went of course you haven't but think has she any friends or relatives nearby not one are there any trains about the time she left i don't know what time she left but there's been no train since nine thirty and i doubt she was in time for that she took no luggage no i'll vouch for that then she's likely in the neighborhood is there any inn or place she could get a room and board oh land she hasn't gone away to stay she's scared at something most likely and she'll be back by nightfall she may and she may not she must be found wait has she a lover well they do say fulton the chauffeur is sweet on her but i never noticed it much who said he was mostly she said it herself she ought to know me for fulton good-bye cookie for the nonce and waving a smiling farewell fibsy went off toward the garage End of chapter 13